uh, thank you all. Um, I would like to call the meeting to order and I would like to start with Bruce to give us an update on the start of the year with a new fleet. And Bruce, for Brad and Quixada's uh, information or update, you might want to update how this all started a little bit and why we're ahead of the game. So we have deployed a new fleet and that fleet came about after last year, we extended our existing fleet by a year and saved that yearly payment and used the MLTI deployment for a fifth year. And with that payment, we were able to order earlier in the season and we ordered back in March so that we would receive shipment of our devices before school let out, where normally the MLTI rotation would occur and did occur as anticipated this summer, MLTI finally shipped their devices in the third week of August. But we received our devices in the first week of May and we prepared the staff devices and sent them swap their old devices out and sent those devices home with them for the summer and spent the summer preparing the student devices and packing the old devices. So the student devices got prepared and put in the classroom and ready for them upon arrival. And the most of our old devices are already packaged up and Second Life Mac comes next Tuesday to pick up our old fleet and pay us rather well for it. The anticipated quote was $388,000, but we are still missing some devices. Not every device has found its way home. We're still chasing around some students and some staff and some people have moved away. And so inevitably we won't have all of them, but we're making our best shot at making sure we have all of them. And on Tuesday they come and pick up those devices and probably be another 30 or 60 days before they assess the inventory when they get back home with it. And then we would get our payment for it. Also today, I'm still awaiting to hear back from Verizon. Um, we've applied through the federal COVID grant for the emergency connectivity fund for hotspots for students. And so we were able to reactivate hotspots that the DOE provided us last year. Um, we have 60 of those that we've activated at this point, but it hasn't finished going through yet. Uh, we still anticipate the return of some of those hotspots as well with from last year. Some haven't found their way back home yet either, uh, but we're still scurrying trying to find the people and the devices so that we can have our full suite. But we have, at this point, we have 49 households reporting uh, lack of internet. And so we'll be able to accommodate those as soon as this process activates through Verizon. Fabulous. That's really good news. Uh, how how do, do we intend to be very aggressive about finding the instruments that are no longer around or how are we going to handle this? Or are you going to handle it? Well, it so inevitably, some of them we will just have to take as a loss. Yep. Um, you know, we've done everything we've can to help convince people that the unit has no value to them. We lock the device. The device does not work. For those who haven't returned their device, the device does not work. And if they erase the device, it is automatically aligned with us and comes right back to a lock state again. So the, the unit has no value to them. And unfortunately, I think it's inevitable because some families have just moved away, you know, yeah. Yeah. And, and we won't find those people. Right. But currently yeah. we're at, um, I believe our number right now is down to about 48 devices that haven't found their way home out of over 3,000. I guess that's a pretty good percentage. All the percentage considered. will always be there. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Yada. Danny, but any... Oh, sorry. I just had a question. Sure, um, go ahead. <laughs> first, I wanted to thank you. I, I um, I just saw a new segment on 
the Manchester, New Hampshire schools, and they had, in the chaos of the pandemic, I think they had forgotten to track all the devices. <laughs> um, and so we're doing, we're definitely doing better than that. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure it's very difficult to just to even do that tracking. So I wanted to thank you for what must be a huge amount of work. Um, I just had a question about the hotspots. I guess I was curious if if the hotspots are allocated to students who don't have connectivity at home, if that's the idea behind it to help them have internet connectivity and just like what the criteria were for determining who gets a hotspot. So last school year during the pandemic, the DOE um, surveyed the district to find out who didn't have internet either by availability or by financial means. And so they provided us with um, state funded hotspots with unlimited data on them for the school year. And those hotspots, the SIM card in them expired on July 1. And we have, again, at the beginning of this school year, surveyed the household again to determine who doesn't have internet based upon availability of broadband. So when we use this grant, we have to uh, apply for reimbursement after we've paid for them. And then the grant also requires that you file the demographic data of these people. The federal government has collaborated with all the ISPs, well, the majority of the major ISPs, and established a database that tells them what street addresses do not have internet available to them based upon the compilation of all the other ISPs. And so we have that information and we're doing that and those who qualify for free and reduced lunch would be eligible for a hotspot, even if they had internet available in their area. Does anyone else have any other questions for Bruce? Bruce, once again, thank you. Thank for, you. Thank you. And your team. It, it's my team does a lot of this work. I'm just the one who has to do all the stuff behind it, but the actual legwork is my team. They do so much. Um, and we all appreciate the fact that the process is as easy as it could be, given the support that we received from the board. Well, you're most yeah. welcome, and we certainly do support you because you've made it so easy for the school year to start. Lauren? Yeah, I just want to say that, you know, a long time ago, it was a dream to have one-to-one -one devices, and then it was a dream to have internet at home for kids who need it. So it's just so great that we have that, too. It's just so great that that has happened and happening and will happen. It's fantastic. Thank you. And also, I wanted to add, too, that we are requiring in order to send internet into a house that uh, an adult contact us about the household needing internet so that we ensure that we're not introducing internet into a house without the knowledge of the parents. Great. Yep, good. Very good. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you and everybody. Yes. Any other questions for Bruce at this moment? Thanks again, Bruce. It, Thank you. I'm so happy that the rollout was smooth and every all the equipment arrived. Yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah, I got to think that for the districts who got their devices the end of August. Oh my God, right? Yeah. yeah. That's why we did what we did. Yeah. So that worked. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, if there are no other questions for Bruce, Stephanie is going to give as a review of data from the iReady Diagnostic One. <laughs> yeah, and I'll start with a little background information as well uh, for you. those who are new. Um, so last year we piloted a new math program and the research for the pilot began the year previous to that. And the research to prepare for that began even the year previous to that. So this has sort of been an ongoing <laughs> process. Uh, we put together a vertical math team across the district to take a really close look at what are some of the needs um, in terms of math and support for students. And we identified two major needs. Um, one of them was um, 
a deeper understanding of the standards and how math connects to the standards, especially in our K-5 um, group, but really um, K-12 all the way through, we reorganized and reworded all of our math standards that are in power school. So that took place the first year. Um, and then we also identified that supports for students as they go up through each grade level, we call it intervention, that those interventions need to be strengthened as well. Um, all of that work is sort of still ongoing, um, but one of the things that the math team specifically identified is it's really challenging when in, in K-5, students that get to the middle school have had two very different math programs and two very different experiences within those math programs. And one was quite outdated. It was from um, 2009. And it was actually written before this, the new Common Core math standards were um, adopted. So we now have one math program for K-5, which is very exciting. It was piloted last year by half of the district. And that was sort of by default. That wasn't really a purposeful design. We usually pilot with with, um, uh, at least two to three teachers from each grade level. Um, but what also happened was one of those programs that was the 2009 program um, suddenly was just not available for purchase anymore. We couldn't get any of the books. We had no notification from the company at all that that was going to be the case. <clears throat> so I called up our representative from the pilot program and I said, can I add a few more teachers to the pilot? And they were wonderful um, and, and very supportive of that. So we got very lucky. Thomas and Grammar School and Cushing Community School, um, fully, all of their teachers were involved in the pilot. We had one teacher from Ash Point, uh, sorry, two teachers from Ash Point Community School, kindergarten teachers that were involved in the pilot and then a sampling of teachers from self school. So many of our teachers, even though this is sort of our first full implementation year, many of them have already been using it for a year. So it's really not brand new for them. Um, but certainly we do have some teachers that it is brand new for. And, and to say that we're um, starting it as a whole district, this is the first year that everybody across the district in K-5 is using the new math program. Um, so we initially held a training on June 2nd and June 9th. We really made use of our Wednesdays that were available to K-5 last year because um, students were in session Monday, Tuesday. Um, they were not in on Wednesdays. That was a teacher work and, and prep day. And honestly, that Wednesday saved us many times from having to do some contact tracing. Um, but we made use of those at the end of the year so that we could start training. We got teachers there. Um, uh, their teacher manuals early so that they could have them all summer um, and, and just sort of did a walkthrough so that they could be familiar with the materials. Um, by the end of July, they had their online access, which is a big component of the program as well. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. That's sort of the learning curve for us. Um, and then September 2nd, our second in-service day of uh, the start of this year, we did a grade level specific training. So every grade had a two hour training with our um, trainers that flew in to um, train us in person, which we did not have during the pilot year. We did all of our training online, but it, it seemed to work really smoothly. Um, the downside of September 2nd was that internet, we had an internet glitch. It was not us, it was Spectrum. <laughs> that, um, an internet glitch across the, um, I think two counties actually. And we were impacted by that, but our trainers had a backup plan. They were great. Um, and then we were informed at the beginning of October by um, the company that they were no longer sending trainers due to COVID and, and so many people within the company testing positive, and they did not want to have to deal with any of the flights um, and those types of situations. So we did have another training October 8th after we gave the first diagnostic, which I'll show you a sample of in just a minute. Um, and that was, that was fully digital and it was all based on grade level as well. So we were still able to get the training in even though we couldn't have the trainers come in person like we did on the second. Um, and then we just had one other training last week on the 14th with just our building administrators because it's not only important to have our teachers involved in the trainings but also to really have the administrators understand the data of their school and how to respond to that data and how to support teachers in using that data. And that's the piece where we sort of 
um, probably need additional work. It's going to take a while for that to, to really um, be a place where we can benefit, but this program is a great jumping off point for that. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of things in terms of um, our data. I'm, I'm talking about diagnostic number one. Um, in this program, we give three diagnostics throughout the year. It's sort of like a screening tool. So we do diagnostic one in the fall, we, we give another diagnostic in the winter, and then we give another diagnostic in the spring, and we're always looking for growth. We're trying to get students that it might be multiple years behind grade level onto grade level, and then trying to push those kids that are ahead um, to push them even further. So I'm gonna share my screen. And can everybody see sort of a teal blue screen? Yes. So yeah. this is great. This is the iReady dashboard. Um, and I'm going to show you a report with some of our diagnostic results um, as a district for the fall. So when I pull this up, it shows me overall placement. We have assessed 611 students, and that's in all four of our elementary schools. And um, this data overall doesn't look too bad. We have a lot in the yellow, which shows one grade level below. But what you have to remember about this fall data is you might have a second grader taking the assessment. And if they are scoring really well on second grade material, which is, uh, sorry, really well on first grade material, which is what we're hoping, because that's what they learned last year, they would be in this yellow section. So the yellow isn't bad at the beginning of the year. Um, it just means that they might not be into any of the second grade material yet, which we really wouldn't expect when we're assessing them in the fall. Um, and this assessment was administered, I think I opened the window um, September, two, nope, one, two, September 13th through uh, October 7th. So it was a four week window. So there may have been students that took this assessment as early as the second week of school. So the yellow really, if it, one grade level below doesn't mean it's a problem area. It just means that they're proficient in the skills that they learned last year. But what we do get concerned about is students in this red area because these students, um, this is a little bit of a, a lighter red. It doesn't have the lines in it. These students, 21% of all of our K through fifth graders are two grade levels below. And I wouldn't really include K in that because you can't be two grade levels below in kindergarten. Um, but of all of our students that were tested, 130 of our students are considered two grade levels below. And of all of our students, again, 611 that were tested, 52 of them were three or more grade levels below. So that is concerning. And I know last year when I did the data review with, um, during a workshop, I think it was in February, it was based on our fall to winter data. Overall, the data looked really good when we look at that, the, the big data picture as a whole, aside from two major red flag areas. I, and I think I mentioned that this year as well. The major red flag areas last year were um, third grade math and second grade literacy and math. And what we're starting to see with this year's data, and you're gonna see it in just a moment when I pull up some school grade level based reports, fourth grade this year, which was our third grade students last year that were red flagged in math, fourth grade is still lagging behind in their scores. So that's concerning. Uh, that's an area that we're, we just know that we need to continue to focus on um, using the program materials to help differentiate um, the instruction for that group of students. So I'll, I'll show you each school really briefly and then just give you a sample of what we look at for grade levels. Um, third grade, which would be our second grade students last year that were behind in literacy and math. Um, is not as concerning, but it's, it probably is still a close second in some of our schools to fourth grade, but at fourth grade across the district is the one that is standing out the most right now. Um, so, oops, let me back up here for just a second. So Ash Point Community School, 
Um, you can see their snapshot when we look at students who are um, one grade level below. Again, that's, that's not concerning at this point, but um, ones that might be two grade levels below and two or more grade levels below. And then this chart just breaks it out so that you can see um, by percentage. You really want the bulk of your percentage to be um, in the, the green or the yellow at this point of the school year, which Ash Point Community Schools is. Um, Cushing Community School, we have a bit more of a bump here up in the red, 29% um, two grade levels below and 6% are three or uh, two, sorry, three or more grade levels below. Um, South School also has that bit of a bump here with um, scores that are a little bit more in the concerning range. And then Thomaston Grammar School um, is a little bit more similar to Ash Point Community School overall when you just sort of look at the, um, the picture here with seeing the bulk of their students here in the yellows and the greens. Um, I think one thing that's interesting to point out is last fall when we looked at this data, it was more concerning than this data looked. Um, one of the things that we noticed was there was a huge increase in student scores from fall, uh, from fall to winter. And I think when I um, described it to this group, I don't think I went into as much detail with the whole board when I did the workshop data, but I did do a, um, a dive into the iReady specific data. And we talked about those triangles and how at the beginning of the year, the red is at the top of the triangle. And we had some cases where um, in a, a, a given grade level at a school, you might've had like 49% of your students in the red part of the triangle, which was really concerning. And then by um, winter, that number might've gone down to 17%. So there was a big gain in skill review um, when we went from the fall to the winter. And I think part of that is because it wasn't that students lost skills from, from going to remote learning into the summer. It's just that they needed more review um, to pick those back up. We did not see that as much in reading because I think many families find that more of second nature. You know, I'm gonna read with my children at home and that's gonna help them stay caught up in their skills. We didn't see as much of that slide in our fall data in reading as we did in our math data. Um, so I will just show you really briefly what I mean in terms of looking at that grade level data. I'll pull up Ash Point Community School. And when I scroll down here, again, you can sort of get like a snapshot glimpse just by looking at the colors alone and you'll see fourth grade stands out. So when we look at that percentage of students, 32% of our fourth graders at Ash Point are in that dark red, which again, up here, three or more grade levels below. So that's concerning. Um, Kindergarten, of course, doesn't have any red because, again, they're not going to be two or more grade levels below. Um, but our hope is that as we continue to use the instruction um, that's provided and really try to make sure that we're differentiating for our students, we're going to be able to close that gap. And I know that last year I mentioned there weren't major gaps. We talk about learning loss. There wasn't major learning loss at grade levels besides those two red flag areas. I didn't see that data across the whole district, but there are for sure pockets of greatly impacted students. And that's, what we, that's the level that we wanna make sure that we're paying attention to. And this program really allows us to do that. And I'm gonna show you a few ways that that's possible. Um, and how we can use the data that we're provided. Um, so I won't jump into every single school here in a lot of detail, but I just wanna show you briefly the picture. Again, I mentioned that third grade and fourth grade math because those were last year's second and third graders. Um, you can see third grade is a bit more concerning here. Cushing is interesting. Um, I think I mentioned this last year as well, but it's certainly worth repeating. Their third grade, um, has had more significant um, educational disruptions than other grade levels in most schools. So their kindergarten year, they had a teacher um, that um, got done halfway through the year and had a new teacher that started. 
Um, so that's an educational disruption. So one that's you know somewhat out of our control. Um, when they started their first grade year, um, they had a, a teacher that was on maternity leave for the first several weeks. So they were starting their year with a sub. And then of course, the last few months of their first grade year was complete remote learning. Um, so that's, those students are now our current third grade. Um, so that principal is well aware of the needs of that group um, and is continuously trying to differentiate. Um, and then also you can see sort of the fourth grade concern echoed there as well. Um, let me pull up South School. Uh, this school is interesting. You can see sort of a progression here of that yeah. gap. It's, it's not, um, it goes down just a little bit in fifth grade. Um, but oftentimes you see this increased progression in students falling behind when interventions are not working as well as they should be working to try to get kids caught up. Um, self school, the whole school did not pilot this program last year. And one of the beauties of the program is your ability to provide interventions that match up specifically to the instruction and are not just simply pull out. So again, I'll show you a few of those in just a moment, but this is a really good picture of what the math team indicated as one of the issues. When, when, you, when you notice gaps and we don't solve the gaps, they just grow over time. And then students get into middle school and high school with all sorts of, of um, issues. Um, and then Thomaston Grammar School. Again, this is a school that piloted um, the program last year. You don't see that same succession of sort of those issues increasing, um, but you can see third grade. Again, they were the, some of the second graders last year of the more uh, problematic group, sort of the red flag group um, does have an increase there. Fourth grade, not quite as much. Um, but certainly still an area that 27% of your grade level is still concerning, even though there are others that show some additional concerns. Um, so I'll pause there for just a minute. Are there any questions about um, the school specific or district wide data? Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, I'm curious how this might be tracking relative to other districts vis-a-vis -vis COVID and the remote learning that was necessary for teaching instruction. Um, are you seeing the same sort of trends and, and sort of same sort of, I mean, I don't know how, how your teachers are feeling about it, but I, I, I imagine that there was some learning loss due to the remote learning requirements. And I'm just curious about how that is impacting the general overall trends. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, last year when I did my data study, um, a couple, months later, iReady came out with a data study as well. And when I read through that, interestingly, um, their two red flag um, areas were second grade math and third grade math, and also happened to be second grade literacy as well, because iReady also has um, a, a reading assessment platform with diagnostics in reading as well. So our data matched exactly what iReady was showing for their data, which th this is nationwide. There's not a ton of schools that use iReady. Um, it's, it's starting to increase up in, um, in, in Maine and the New England area, but across the country, schools have been using iReady data probably as often as we've been using NUIA data. That's sort of like the, um, we've been using NUIA for years and years and years and have all sorts of, um, cohort studies and data studies that we've been tracking over time. Um, and so iReady is relatively new, but it's, it's more new to us than it is nationally. Any other questions? I had a yeah. question. Um, Stephanie, first, I wanted to thank you. I mean, the way that you're able to use data to identify, you know, potential issues in the school and get in front of it is just really, it's really amazing. And, um, that's the power of data, right? But I think we, like in life, we don't always use data well and I can see how much you're using it to inform practice. So I really wanna thank you for that and all the time that's gone into this. Um, uh, I think, you know, I, I had a couple questions sort of similar to, to Brad's, I think. Um, I guess um, 
one question that I don't think we can necessarily answer today, but just to surface for the future is around like, you know, once we get some longitudinal data, um, it'd be interesting to see what's going on with third and fourth grade over time. Um, it's hard to it's hard to make comparisons right now because first of all, you you know, it's a it's a new program. And second of all, we had this really weird thing that happened, right, with the pandemic, which throws everything off. Um, but I, you know, um, it seems like that could be a really good area to focus on professional development, you know, retreats or like teacher workshop days on trying to do some detective work of what's going on if you see, if you end up seeing a, a long-term trend, which it sounds like the national data may be pointing some fingers at. Um, and I think the sort of related thought that I had is, you know, I mean, the the 42% at, at Ash Point is, is definitely alarming. Um, I can see that you're getting in front of it. So that's great. But I, you know, I'd be curious to, to learn as you process this, you know, how the different principals are, are thinking of addressing it, particularly with that cohort. So they're not behind, you know, in, in the long term. Um, so, you know, I don't know if you, if you know that yet, but, but if you, if you don't, it'd be great if you could keep us posted. And if you do, if they already have some plans, it'd be interesting to hear them. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about um, a few of those. I think it's definitely something that we're going to continue to watch, but um, principals are already being quite proactive, um, even in terms of hiring additional ed techs to support grade levels, general ed techs. Um, and I know specifically at Ash Point, um, they have hired two additional ed techs with some of the COVID funding that was on the list of the approved um, ESSER positions, just in order to support some of those smaller pullout groups. And I want to mention in just a minute what teachers can now do with some of that data with their pullout groups. And it's no longer on the burden of the teacher to design what that instruction looks like. It's right at their fingertips. And we've been really good in the past about collecting all sorts of data, but really using it to make informed instructional decisions is the big shift that we're making, especially with this program. The program makes it easy, um, but that doesn't mean that it's not time consuming and different from what we've done in the past. So that's sort of the learning curve for teachers. Um, in terms of why is it second grade and third grade, the math shifts between second grade and third grade. So at the end of second grade, um, students with numbers base 10 are doing a lot with multi-digit numbers. And so when they start to miss that piece on multi-digit numbers and really understanding the tens place, the 100s place, the 1000s place, and the value that's there, and then being able to carry that knowledge into third grade, where third grade is where they introduce multiplication and division and um, multi-digit addition and subtraction it's much more complex than it is in those earlier grade levels. So I think that's part of the reason why we're, we're seeing more issues in that started in those two grade levels that are carrying on with those students than what we've seen that's impacted any other grade level. It's some of those key foundational skills that went unfinished or students really just weren't internalizing those as much as they may have when if they were in person as opposed to remote learning and then really being able to use that to get into the more complex third grade math so that's my understanding of the problem as it is right now but it's certainly something that we're continuing to investigate as well and i want to talk about um the data and how teachers can use it so i'm going to pull just a couple of examples for you and then we can um, address any additional questions. So one of the beauties of the program, um, I'm not pulling this live, I've made a couple of samples here, but can you guys see something on my screen that says prerequisites at the top? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, from the same reporting platform that I was on earlier, when teachers go in, they can pull something called a prerequisite report. And a prerequisite report, so I just went in here as a Cushing Community School, I picked fourth grade. Um, and I went in here as a, as a teacher and after I've given diagnostic one to all of my students, I can go in here and I can pull a, a prerequisite report for unit one, which are lessons one through five. And it will tell me based on that diagnostic data, how to group my students. So 
um, I don't have any students here in group A, which would be really the students that are ready to move ahead. So I know as a teacher, I'm not gonna be instructing any of my groups on how to move ahead because none of them are quite there yet. Um, my unit group B um, needs some additional support in rounding to the nearest 10 or 100 um, and needs some additional support in subtracting to 1,000. I only have one student in this group. So I might have to think about how do I want to do that level of instruction with just that one individual? Or do I want to think about if that individual might benefit from being in one of these other groups, um, like maybe group C? So this group, I have four students here um, that need in-depth review of rounding to the nearest 10 or 100, um, need some additional support with adding within 1,000, and then need in-depth review of subtracting within 1,000. And then my unit D group needs the most support, in-depth review of all three of those skills. So my prerequisite tells me exactly what my students need, and it doesn't look the same for every unit. So that's unit one. When I go back in here and I'm preparing for unit two, just watch the bottom part of my screen, these yellow, these are all student names, obviously I've covered them up, but just watch how the yellow changes. Okay, so this is unit two. My groups are gonna be different because my students scored differently on these skills than they did on the first set of skills. So now I do have two students that are, they're all set they're ready for the next step. Um, and I have a larger group this time that really just needs some additional support. Um, they don't really need an in-depth review. So I can, I can use my data through the whole fall until the winter to really think about what my instruction will look like, what my small groups will look like. And then I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for just a minute because you'll see at the top here, if I'm a teacher, I might also wanna know um, okay, these kids need additional support. What might that look like? Do I have to come up with that on my own? Or these kids all need in-depth review. How's that going to look different from additional support? That was all on our teachers to figure out in, in our math program and honestly in, in lots of other programming as well. And our teachers don't have much in terms of planning time. So now I'm gonna just jump into a different document because um, this really is one of my favorite things about this program. So, oops, no, if, let me try that one more time. Well, Can you guys see something at the top of my screen that says recommendations? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so I just clicked on and just made a copy of recommendations for unit group D, that group that needs all that in-depth level review. And I have a whole document here that tells me exactly how to do that in-depth review with them. Um, so, if they need multiplication facts in-depth review, I can do a teacher-led small group. I can do independent reinforcement with them. This shows me where I can go to find those resources. Some of them are online. Some of them are in the teacher textbook. Maybe I have an ed tech for some math support during my math time, and I can provide them with this. So I can say, okay, I'm gonna have you take this small group and I'm gonna have you work on adding using arrays with this group. Here's the materials and this is what they're practicing. Um, or because this group needs in-depth review, I'm gonna take them as the teacher, I'm gonna work on them. And then this other group that maybe just needs um, some additional support and practice, maybe uh, the ed tech will work with that group. Or maybe I don't have ed tech support in my room and I'm going to have kids practice some independent reinforcement if they just need additional support, well, I work with the group that needs in-depth review. So I can start making decisions about how I want the instruction to look as opposed to what the instruction needs to be. Because what the instruction needs to be is now given to me as a teacher. I just need to make the decisions of when and where is that instruction going to take place. And that's a huge shift, um, again, that's what we're, we're trying to get teachers to understand. But 
Um, that takes a lot off the teacher's plate. And here's the other great thing that it does. So it gives some small group ideas so that you can differentiate more specifically for the needs of kids. And I'm gonna pull up one more thing here. Uh, I'm back to the prerequisite report, but this time I've pulled up an individual fourth grader. Um, this is what the diagnostic results look like for an individual. And this is a fourth grader, and this would be a concerning report to look at. So first thing I look at as a teacher is they're in the 20th percentile. So I know that they're going to need some additional support. I might be putting this child on a tier one RTI plan, which is response to intervention. I might be putting them on a tier one plan if they aren't already, uh, because they really need some significant additional support in mathematics. And then I can see the areas that they need that additional level, number and operations and al algebra and algebraic thinking. But I might wanna know, okay, what is it that they need for instruction? Not groups anymore, but what does the individual student need? And so I can click on these can do next steps and it brings up a report that looks like this. Here's the things that they can do. Here's their next steps and resources for every single thing in number and operations that they need in order to help them close the gap. So for our um, students that need RTI, response to intervention, for a, a teacher plan within the classroom, the resources are right there. For our, teacher, uh, our students that are in Title I because they um, need Tier two level of intervention, Here's the next steps for our kids. We don't have to guess, it's right there. And it matches what exactly what they need. Um, for our students who are special education students that need specially designed math instruction, they're not getting their math instruction in the regular classroom. Um, they're getting specially designed instruction from their special education teachers, but their teachers don't need to figure that out on their own, it's right here. So. That's a big game changer in terms of math instruction, which again, this is what I'm the most excited about. The tools are at our fingertips, thinking about where and how to place that instruction rather than what the instruction needs to be um, is more of the educational game that I want to be playing as opposed to, you know, everybody's pulling from different resources and, you know, going to teachers, pay teachers and pulling things from here and there to try to fill the gaps. I don't think that's effective. But thinking about sound instruction from, this is a, a reputable company. It aligns to um, the mathematics teaching standards, not just the common core, but the teachers for teaching mathematics, uh, sorry, the standards for teaching mathematics. Um, and so we don't have to do any of that guesswork. We just have to think about where and how can this instruction take place? So that was a lot <laughs> question. Carol? Yeah, I have what's probably a general question, um, you know, being from the dinosaur age, I don't know this. Numbers and operations, is that what we used to call arithmetic? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Why don't we just call it arithmetic? <laughs> well, this isn't an us. This is national. I'm, national I'm, yeah, situation. I'm asking that question as a national question. Yeah, I don't know. I can't answer it. <laughs> it and does that include um, memorizing uh, math fa arithmetic facts like times tables and, and all of that along with counting and so um, counting and cardinality is specific to kindergarten. Um, that's the only place that counting shows right. up, the, the counting and cardinality standard. Um, and then the, the fluency is what it's called. It's not, it, it, memorization is not encouraged. Fluency is encouraged. And it's really having that deep understanding of how numbers work, how they're built together, how you can take them apart. Um, and that's what builds fluency. And there's lots of opportunities in this program for that fluency practice. So it's not so much memorizing your times tables as it is understanding how numbers work and fit together and you can take them apart so that you can multiply them and divide them and the, the, the fact families. Okay. Seems like we're making it harder, not 
easier. Just saying. Well, I will be, I'll, I'll just share a little anecdote. Um, when I started working with teachers on the standards and we were rewording the I can statements and matching it up to the common core, I think I was taught sort of the memorization route. And I was terrible at card games and adding cards. And I was always embarrassed because when I had to count up my cards at the end, I was always counting on my fingers. And my husband who works at a bank would always make fun of me. <laughs> but understanding the language of the standards and what's being taught and how it's being taught and how you put numbers together to make 10 and then you get from the 10 to the next number makes so much sense. And I've applied some of those to my own life. So when I'm doing, you know, counting up my card game, I, I'm faster than he is now. And I'm teaching my kids that. And I think one of the really interesting things about math is it's not all about just memorizing facts. It's how numbers fit and work together. And that is a game and that's really fun. And I think that's what teachers are trying to incorporate more into their classrooms they've got great games that they're teaching the kids, but math is really built into a lot of different card games. War, they have a, a um, I don't think they actually call it war, they call it something else, but it's kind of like the, the card game that you used to play with war, but then the kids have to count it up and then they have to compare who has the higher number. So it's, it, it's integrated. I don't think it's a second nature for families as reading a book at home is, um, and I think, again, that's why we're seeing those math scores lagging more than um, the reading scores. Um, that's kind of where I was going because, um, you know, I see my, some of my younger grandchildren, um, the, their work on the page is so much bigger. It has all this stuff and it's not answer driven it doesn't seem to be answer driven and I really want my pharmacist and my doctor and my banker and my investment people to to get it right at the end to not have oh well this is uh, this I was thinking about it sorry you lost a hundred thousand dollars but I thought about it rightly so I I just wonder applications in the real world it just seems like um I don't know, confusing to me. And I admit, I was great at arithmetic, terrible at mathematics, and they're not the same thing. Right. So I just, I have concerns that the lag may be a disconnection between home, meaning parents and grandparents, and the kid who's coming home with something that doesn't at all make sense to their older generations. Yeah. And so I, I wonder think, how we bridge that. I think companies have been picking up on that. And so with this program, there's a family letter and you can, teachers can send home a family letter every week that explains, this is what we're working on this week. This is how you do it. Uh, this is how we're teaching it. This is how you can practice it at home. And, and, you know, you can ask questions of your children and, um, I always try to sort of a, apply it to a real world example for my kids. So if we're in a store and they ask how much is, if I buy this and I buy this, you know, this is $8 and this is $6. And I'm like, well, what's eight plus six. And that might not be automatic. I have a second grader, so it's not automatic for her. But when I say, well, what to, to get that eight up to a 10, what do you need? And she'll say two. Okay. It's 14. So that's there, the building that foundation. And once that foundation is there, the fluency and automaticity will follow. You know, once they know how numbers work together, cause she's thinking in her mind, she didn't say it out loud, but she's thinking, okay, I need two from that six. And I know from that six, there's four left over. And I already know 10 plus four is 14. Cause those ones are easy when you add them to 10. That is what we want to get automatic not just I've memorized that eight plus six is 14. Yeah, that makes a lot you, of sense. Yeah. Can you uh, uh, show us the iPad user interface for students? Is that showable here now? I, because that's I just another interesting. I know. I, I assume they're right doing their work on iPads, <clears throat> which is how these teachers get this kind of data continuously. So the data is from one assessment. It's just, it's one diagnostic assessment and it's, um, it's a, called a CAT. It's a computer oh. adaptive assessment. 
but they okay. also have, based on their diagnostic data, they have something called my path and they work on my path independently. So uh, that, that fourth grade student that I showed you that had those two areas in red that were two grade levels behind, that student is gonna be fed through the my path um, uh, practice that's specific to those areas of need. So it, it, there is a, a digital component, but it's not all online. That's what a teacher might say a student should work on because I'm gonna pull this small group up here because they have some additional um, needs. So after I've given my whole class lesson, I'm gonna pull a small group and then you five are gonna work on your independent my paths. And then you other five are gonna work on this practice that I'm giving you because you need a little bit of additional practice. So, and I don't have it right in front of me to pull up the, the student interface. Go ahead, Brad. Thanks, uh, Stephanie, that was terrific. I really got a much better understanding of how the diagnostics are working. And I'm curious, you mentioned there's one diagnostic so far, are there gonna be others? And if so, how frequently? And then a follow-up question, um, now that you're able to sort of track the student progress more with a spotlight than with floodlights and say, you know, individual students are, tracking at certain levels in certain areas. Does it make sense? And I'm, I'm mixed on this, so it's, it's a really open question. I'm not trying to lead you in any direction, but does it make sense to have certain students who have certain um, needs or need additional instruction in certain areas merge with other classes with a similar sort of need so that the teachers can uh, zero in on those classes? Because I imagine that it's hard to differentiate instruction for four different groups with one teacher during one period especially if you don't have someone else helping out. So is there some wisdom to sort of say here during this period, one teacher is gonna work on this particular set and another teacher is gonna work on another particular set, you know, dependent upon the diagnostic data that you've, you've recovered from these tests? So that's a really interesting question. And I have had this conversation with principals because that's something that I think we tend to go back and forth on, you know, these small groups and, can we have flexible grouping? Flexible grouping is really hard right now with COVID. <laughs> yeah. um, and I actually suggested to principals, let's maybe not do that as often at the moment. Um, but the beauty of this program is it's identifying the needs. And you saw when I went from prerequisite report one to prerequisite report two, the needs change. So, and you asked about how often is this given? So this will be administered again in January because there's instruction and then you're, you're pulling your prerequisite reports and providing or diagnostic tests, then instruction. Another diagnostic in January that then when you pull your prerequisite report, it has that new diagnostic assessment in it. Then you're providing your instruction from January through May. And then we administer again in May to see, you know, where are we at the end of the year and pulling those prerequisites for those last few weeks of school. Um, I would be hesitant. It's this, the program is really intended for a, a classroom where you're not constantly sending them into different rooms or different spaces because the needs of each individual, like if I was to pull up the, the profile, like I showed you of that fourth grade student, if I was to pull up five more, they're all different. And if I was to pull up a classroom, maybe two of them out of a classroom of 16 might look the same, but those kids do not all need the same thing. Um, and there actually is a report that I could show you, but it would take me a minute to get to it without showing the student names on the screen. But um, it's a report that looks like little, little square boxes. And then for the four different domains, each student gets a, a color in the domains. And that color might be the dark green, the light green, the yellow, the red, or the dark red. And so when you pull that report up, hardly any two students look the same. same. And so when I think about grouping and regrouping students, for individual lessons, it makes sense, but you might not send them in a different place because even though for that lesson, you might have group D that's two grade levels behind, they're not really doing second grade math. They're doing math that's gonna pull them up to the fourth grade math. They're still, the, this, the bar is still that fourth grade skill 
they're going to be doing practice that's going to pull them up to that fourth grade skill. So they're not really doing second grade math. Does that make sense? Uh, it makes sense to me. I guess um, I just I think this is just a, a really wonderful tool. And I'm wondering how to optimize the information that you have gathered from that tool in terms of differentiating the instruction. And, and of course, during COVID, it doesn't make sense to sort of shuffle students around because you, you have that additional health risk. But in a post pandemic world, you know, maybe, maybe it would make a little bit more sense or maybe it would make sense to combine two or three math teachers and math classes at, at one time and, and have them rotate a little bit more depending upon the content that the teachers are trying to you know, convey. Or I, I, It's an open question. Again, I, I don't know that even that's the best approach. It just begs the question because you have this data that you may not have had access to before. One thing that um, principals have been experimenting with, with the support of their teachers and staff are push-in models. So for Title I, even for special education, a push-in model puts that additional resource of the teacher in the classroom as opposed to pulling one or two students out and focusing. And that has two benefits. Number one, it gives more resources into that classroom. And number two, the student doesn't change their location and then there's a disconnect and they can't transfer. So it eliminates that issue of inability to transfer knowledge because it's happening in my math class and it's connected to the skill that I need in order to do the lesson as opposed to I'm being pulled out to do basic addition and subtraction, but we're not even doing that in my math class right now. We're doing you know, greater than less than value. So um, I think the push-in model as we continue to explore that is going to really work well with this program. I think also Stephanie, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think there's probably still some stigma attached to, oh, I have, I'm being singled out to go someplace else because I'm not good at this yeah. thing that everybody yeah. else is doing. Right. So I, I like the idea of the push in rather than the pull out, yeah. just, just even for that reason. Yes, I, that's a great idea. Now we're almost at the end of our meeting time and Stephanie, God bless you. <laughs> All the work that you've been doing on this program for the last, well, three years, right? I can remember when all those books arrived. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so well, it was a hallway full of them. I, I do want to mention just really briefly, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, Susan, but- That's okay. One of the cons right now is the distractibility that we all have with COVID. It's, it just takes over everything. And um, I know at the last board meeting, it was discussed how, you know, our cases have gone down. Well, now they're going back up <laughs> and, and they have been since um, I think it, it was stated at that board meeting. And then yeah. um, that Saturday we had a case and then Sunday and then Monday there were three. And then, I mean, it just, it's been nonstop since then. So we're sort of seeing this increase and it takes so much time and effort and energy into something that you know, we want to be focused on education and instruction and our, our attention is constantly being taken in this other direction and it doesn't feel as fulfilling, but it's a must and, and we understand that and we do what needs to be done. But I mean, a great example is in our training for administrators, administrators are trying to listen to this training and take it in and think about what needs to be done at their school and then having to turn off the camera and take a phone call. And then they're, you know, being asked, they've, they've got a COVID case that they're dealing with, or they're trying to get caught up because they had a COVID case yesterday. So then there's these other issues that arise and it is just all consuming. So a huge shout out to all the teachers and administrators that are just continuing to make things run. But I just wanted to put that little note out there that it is, a huge challenge this year, even more challenging than last year. I can certainly understand that. And again, a shout out to all of our terrific teachers and administrators. John, do you have anything you'd like to add? You know, I do. Oh, of course. <laughs> so a couple things. Um, I would have dearly loved these resources as a teacher. I mean, the diagnostic information. Yeah the data that they have, the ease with which they can get reports. 
on their students and then the resources they have to support them are absolutely wonderful. I, I mean, I can certainly re recall trying to do a lot of that digging myself. And as Stephanie mentioned, pulling bits and pieces together to try to meet kids where they are. And um, it's a wonderful resource for teachers, but it's also equally a great resource for administrators to take a look and uh, more broadly in terms of the trends in their schools. And then for us, the trends in the school district. So that's highly encouraging. Um, the other little ray of sunshine, uh, if there is any, we had a statewide meeting with Dr. Shaw uh, this morning, oh. all the superintendents. And the one thing Dr. Shaw said with the inception of the vaccine for younger children, quote, he said, I expect next semester to be much different and better than this semester. So if he's seeing some light at the end of the tunnel, I am certainly encouraged. As are we all, I'm sure. And hopefully you and Stephanie can get a little more rest from the nonstop work with COVID <laughs> plus everything else. Does anyone else have any other comments they would like to make before we? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Lauren. one more thing. And I have to speak really lowly because my wife is in the other room on a Zoom call and she texted me, can you move somewhere else? And I can't. Anyway. What I love about this, there are many things I love about what you're doing and what our staff is doing, but um, as I said before, I'm really hopeful about when kids get into high school, that their skills in this area are really, really lock solid because we know from data over time and here and statewide and nationally that kids are really struggling with mathematics and everything related to it. So I'm really hopeful, not only now of reaching our kids where they're at, but also you know down the road in years ahead that they get into high school and move into the rest of their lives with much stronger skills that way. So it's really exciting on many levels. Thank you. And thank all the staff. Yes. Well, I have to just add one more thing really quickly, because I said this last year, but I, I want to make sure that our new members hear this as well. So um, Cushing did a poll last year, sort of a, you know, how are you doing for their kids? And, um, you know, what's going, what's going well about the year? Um, math scored higher than friends. Math liking math. And so that was a school that did the, the full yeah. pilot. And my daughter on Friday, she had a doctor's appointment and the doctor said, what do you like about school this year? And she goes, I really love our math program. I did not coach. Oh, her my. That, oh my God. <laughs> really yeah, that's amazing. So it's great. I think it's boosting confidence in students, math skills, and Good. that is half of the battle in education. Mm. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Confidence and competence stuff. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you all. Again, thank you, Bruce, and your team for getting everything underway so nicely. And pretty soon we'll find out how much we're going to have in return. And thanks also our, for our two new members and adding yes. your brains and your voices to this work. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to have a big crowd. Thanks again. And Stephanie. a smart crowd. And a smart crowd. Crazy cr smart oh, well, crowd. I yeah. can't say that. <laughs> thank you all. Take care. Bye. Stay well. Thank you. Everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Stephanie.